Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath thereof to glory, but not before God. Verse number three. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Verse number five. But to him that worketh not, but believe, believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You may be seated. All right, thank you, Pastor Farouk, and thank you, Scott and Nancy. It's been a great service already, and today um, we are continuing our series in the core Christian doctrines. These are 15 essential doctrines of the Christian faith, and then how they change our, our daily lives. And so we're, we're already over halfway through, if you can believe that, uh, already halfway through the series. And so I have begun uh, praying um, and uh, spending some time with the Lord about what we're going to do next uh, after this. So you can pray along with me if you think about that. Uh, but today, we're talking about salvation. And we've been talking about salvation um, a lot here lately. Uh, we've covered the incarnation um, and then the, the substitutionary death of Christ and then his resurrection last Sunday, which I just, <laughs> I'm still excited from last Sunday. Um, and, uh, but today, um, we're going to cover a topic in detail that, that frankly, I mean, to the best, to the best of my ability as, as a pastor, um, I, I try to cover this at least a little every single Sunday. Um, and so, and that's, and that's as I believe as, as it should be um, in church. But, but the intention uh, today is that we will really examine the, the logical and the theological foundation that underpins, like, the, it's a very simple message. And, and, and many of you, I believe, if I just pointed at you out right now, you could stand up, many of you here, and you would be able to give me the simple explanation of it. And that's good. That's, that's the goal. But how many of you know that once you really understand something, it's easier to explain it? It's easier to put it in simple terms once you've really deeply understood something. And so it's useful and important for us as Christians, and especially because the devil hates this, it's useful and important for us as Christians to have a deep understanding of this, even though it's simple, because the, the better we've got a hold of it, the easier you'll be able to explain it to others when somebody has a question or is confused about some point of this, to be ready to give an answer and to defend what the Christian idea of salvation is. It's different than almost, it's different than any other religion in the world. There are perversions of Christianity that the thing that makes them a cult and not actual Christians is that they have corrupted this doctrine of how, how are you saved? And what do we even mean by that? If you've got your Bible still open to Romans 4, you already stood for the reading of it. I won't ask you to stand again, but, but look at what it says. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining the flesh, is found? For if Abraham were justified by works... He hath whereof to glory, <laughs> but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, if I... <clears throat> so we're going to be in Romans chapter 4. We're going to go through the whole chapter. It is one of the most thorough and just step-by-step -step explanations of the Christian doctrine of salvation by grace that you can find through faith anywhere in the Bible, and we're going to go through it step-by-step. Step. Some of you saw your bulletins when you got in this morning and thought, I, I accidentally walked into a college class, to which I'd say, you're welcome. Uh, th th this is, don't, don't be intimidated. The, the message itself is, is, is tremendously simple. I've already said the message twice. You've already heard the punchline of the sermon twice. 
Um, but we're going we're gonna to really look at it and make sure we've really got a hold of it. I, I just would like a thought experiment before I pray. And that's, imagine if you would, um, and if you've got the church newsletter, you've already heard this story, but this is not a true story, let me say. But imagine with me for a moment that I was at Walmart and I noticed an old lady, uh, an elderly woman struggling with her groceries and, I, and I, my heart is moved with compassion for her and, and so I help her with her groceries. I load them into her car for her and help her with her bags and open the door for her and say, don't worry about the cart, I'll return it. And I do, I don't just leave it in the stall. I actually walk it back and put it in the cart return. And, and that, we would all agree that was a pretty good deed. I said, I did a pretty good deed today. But then if I went into the Walmart and pulled out a gun and robbed the place... And then the police come, and the police come, and I say, well, well, officer, you need to understand, I did a good deed. And so that kind of cancels out the robbery, and so today is really just sort of a push. <clears throat> how many of you know that that is not how the law works? It's not how the law works. By doing some good things, I'm not going to cancel out the bad things. Okay. The Bible tells us that God is perfectly just. He's perfectly holy. And he's perfectly fair. And that heaven, by the way, is a place of perfect righteousness. Now, for those of us who are not perfect, <laughs> We are therefore in big trouble if you had some hopes of going to heaven. Jesus himself warned us like this in Matthew 5. Jesus said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, You better do a whole lot better at being righteous than these people who, if they're going to put salt on their food, take a tenth of the salt and set it aside to give to God. The people who don't eat any of the things God said not to eat and who take their Saturdays off and who observe the Ten Commandments and pay the heave offerings and the, the tithe offerings and the first fruits offerings. The people who wear the tassels on the robes as God has commanded There's 600 commandments in the Old Testament. Many of the Pharisees had memorized them all. The scribes literally could just recite the first five books of the Bible from memory. And Jesus said, I want you to know that unless you do way better than them, you have no hope of going to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that. So, if even the hyper-religious scribes and Pharisees were not good enough at keeping the law to go to heaven, how can any of us hope to be righteous enough? Here, in Romans 4, we get the most detailed, clear, and logical explanation of the Christian doctrine of salvation of how true righteousness is provided by God's grace and received by faith in Jesus Christ. It is beautiful. It is simple. It's powerful. It is life-changing. And it doesn't just change our lives when we get saved. These truths have continued to change my life and the way I live every day. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we just bow our heads one more time here, and God, just, just Lord, beg of you for your help. Lord, I, I know that many people here and, and watching, God, have, have heard these things many times, know, know these fundamental truths. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to engage with it with fresh eyes and a fresh heart today. God, that our, that our understanding of this would, would be deepened and strengthened and grounded Lord, that, you would, that these truths would be deeply rooted into our hearts and into our minds. God, just, just for our own edification, that we, might, that we might be strong in these truths 
And God then able to clearly and compassionately give an answer to people that are around us. God, we might be able to, to speak up for these things and, and explain them to those that are, that are lost and confused and don't understand. That don't understand your amazing, marvelous grace. God, help us help me this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'd like to follow along in your bulletin this morning, we'll fill some blanks in as we go along, or of course, I invite you to just listen. Well, these first three verses that, that we've read here, uh, we're introduced, uh, we're reminded about the example of Abraham and the example that we have of Abraham's righteousness. I, I love here again, the, the author uh, of the scriptures, God is inviting us to engage with the text. God is always inviting us to think about these things, to reason with him about these things, especially when it comes to salvation. We talked about this quite a lot last Sunday. God says, come, let's reason together. Your sins are like scarlet, but I can make them white as snow. Come talk to me about it. Let's have a conversation here. And again, Romans 4 starts in a, in a similar manner with a, with a question that's posed to you and me. And the question goes like this. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father as pertaining to the flesh, has found. What did Abraham figure out? What, what, was, what was the secret sauce that made Abraham Abraham? It's hard to overstate the world-shaking importance of Abraham. I have a map I'll show you here this morning. The stuff in blue are the parts of the world that are dominated by what we call the Abrahamic religions. The, the scope of it is, is kind of mind-numbing when you start to look at it. In Abraham's day, the world had fallen. Now, as Christians, we understand there's only one God. Amen? That's always been true. In the Garden of Eden, they understood only one God, down through Cain and Abel. And, and then by Noah's day, they'd forgotten. So you get the big reset with Noah. Then by the time you get to the Tower of Babel, the world again has, has plunged and degenerated down into ancestor worship. Uh, to polytheism, worshiping many different kinds of gods and gods of all kinds and sorts and combinations of this. And, and so by the time Abraham is born, he's born into a, 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 a world that is filled with polytheism and animism. And against this, Abraham a, is an unusual figure in the world in which he's born. And the faith of one man who really trusted God, turned the whole world upside down. All the, what we call the monotheistic religions today, the religions that believe in just one transcendent God, so God that's not a part of nature, doesn't come about from the spirits of nature, but a God who exists outside of creation is responsible for it. That idea of God, I mean, everybody in the world, every religion in the world that has that kind of an idea of a transcendent creator God, all trace their roots back to Abraham. It's, it's unbelievable. Judaism, of course, Islam, Christianity, they all get grouped together and called the Abrahamic religions. But despite Abraham's immense importance, despite his incredible worldwide impact, I want you to know this morning that Abraham was definitely a sinner. The Bible tells us how he told lies. He had an affair. I mean, his wife agreed to it. It's a very weird story. His wife agreed to it, but still, not a great idea. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, just checking. Despite, despite his great trust in God, there were multiple points in Abraham's life where the Bible tells us about the times where he spectacularly failed to trust God. Go read the story in Genesis, I dare you. Abraham was far, far from a perfectly righteous man. And yet, Abraham is rightly held in very high esteem. That, that's, it, it's right that he's held in high esteem. But why? Why? That's the question. That's the question Romans is, has posed to us. That's the question the Bible is asking us this morning. What is it about Abraham? What did he find? Well, 
Was he just an unusually excellent and well-behaved guy? Do we revere him because of that? Go read his story and figure out if you think that's the reason. I suggest to you it is not. You don't have to wonder. The Bible's going to explain it to us. Verse 2. It says, well, what, what did Abraham find? Here's the answer in verse 2. It says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory. It says, in other words, if, if Abraham is so important and so revered and so famous and so world-changing because he was so well-behaved, because he did such a good job at keeping laws, then he would have something to be pretty smug about. He could toot his own horn and be right to do it. <laughs> but the Bible notes for us that even though he might do better than some of us, than you or I might do, he's not doing as good as God, the standard of perfect righteousness. Abraham might have somewhere to glory, but not before God, who, stand, who God does not grade on a curve. We kind of think that he ought to. Well, I've told fewer lies than some people, right? It's easy to watch the politicians on TV and be like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Between you and me, compared to them, you are. Gold star. But guess what? You don't get to go to heaven for being not as bad as the politicians. Like, what are we talking about here? Even the politicians, you go ask them, they say, well, I'm not as bad as... They can always find somebody. There's probably some lawyer living somewhere who's the worst. No, I'm just... You can always find somebody worse. So what? That's not the standard. So what? It's not the standard. Abraham were justified by works. He have aware of the glory, but not before God. Verse 3, here's the answer. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, here's when we start defining some words. Some of you maybe know these words, good for you. For those of you that maybe some of these words are a little bit new, these are kind of big, big old Bible words. I love big old Bible words, but I want to make sure that we know what they mean. Somebody say Amen. Okay, so this is a great, great Bible word. It's one every Christian ought to know, and the word is righteousness, and it comes from the Greek, of course, here in the New Testament. It's dikeasuna, dikeasuna in the Greek. It's translated as righteousness. That's a good translation of it. Here's what it means. Integrity, virtue, purity, correctness. In fact, in the Greek, the dikeasuna it could be rendered that the Greek words that make it up are literally as we ought to be. So, so righteousness is a state of being the way that we should be. Everybody with me? Okay. It's a condition acceptable to God. Righteousness. That's, that's what it means. How many of you know that we are not as we ought to be? Now, we can go through the law. Sometimes if I get somebody that really thinks, well, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm killing it. Set. <laughs> just set them up, I knock them down. No problem. For those people, we have the law. There's 600 of them. We can just start with what God says. How you doing? And it just doesn't take very long before we find out that they're like, well, I don't think those laws are, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, but God wrote those, so, you know. <laughs> You, you won't get far with a judge by telling him that you think the laws are really silly. <laughs> well, judge, I did break those laws, but those are silly laws. You see, I have laws that I made up, and I keep those laws, so really I'm fine. <laughs> Corrupt human judges won't let that fly, let alone the holy, holy God of all the universe. So, but... If you're not stuck in that, you don't need that much law to figure it out. You just know, I just know, deep in my knower, that I am not the husband that I ought to be. I'm not the father that I ought to be. 
I'm not the pastor that I ought to be. I'm not the man, I'm not the Christian that I ought to be. I'm a trier. You all know me. I'm a trier. God's been working on my heart the last couple of weeks about a commandment of His that I regularly ignore. Because I frankly just kind of don't really believe in it. Now, I believe every word of God is true. But you know the things that you do are a better test of what you actually believe than what you say or think you believe? I could say, I think this building's on fire, but if I laid down and took a nap then, you would think, I'm not sure he really believes that. Right? My, my behaviors are a better indication of what I actually think than what I say I think. Watch what people do more than what they say. It's a better indication of what's actually going on. That one's free. But I've observed that in my life. I say, I trust God. And then I worry and I make plans for in case God doesn't do what he really ought to do so I can handle it. You know, Lord, I trust you, whatever you want to do. And then I immediately start working on my backup plans just in case. I'm not good about taking rest. Real bad at it. I just kind of don't think I can get all the things done that I want to get done, that I think God's calling me to get done. I just kind of don't think I can get them done and take time to rest. There's too much to do. And if you want to argue with me about it, I'll show you my schedule. I'm pretty sure I'm right. So I got a problem with God because God says... Made his top 10 list. My life seems to indicate I don't really believe God. And so I'm not as I ought to be. I want you to know that it's not the only way in which I am not as I ought to be. That's when I feel safe sharing from a pulpit on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Can we be honest this morning? I really believe we ought to at least be able to be honest at least a little bit in church. None of us are as we ought to be. D.K. Asuna, we're not there. Romans 3, is not, this is not just an opinion that the pastor has. Romans 3 says, as it is written, there is none righteous. None, D.K. Asuna. You say, nobody? No, not one. That's what the Bible says. And then the Bible goes on to list a real bummer. Romans 3 is a bummer. <laughs> Don't read it before you go to bed. Because after that, I say, there's none righteous, no, not one. It goes on to list all the ways in which humanity is kind of a downer. And the reason it's a downer is because you read it and you go, that's true. It's true. And then it concludes like this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's come short of the glory of God. Nobody's even close. It's just true. So, well, what about Abraham? Verse 1, what shall we say then about Abraham? What did Abraham find? What did Abraham figure out? How does Abraham become this righteous guy that everybody has all this esteem for? Verse 3, what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God. It's, and the, quoting the Scripture here, that's Genesis 15. It's a direct quote from Genesis 15. It's there in your outline, Genesis 15. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it got counted as righteousness. Now, there's a word we've used twice, and it's time to define it now. What do we mean by counted? This word's going to show up a lot here in Romans 4. Nate, my PowerPoint won't work anymore. All right, so counted here, reckoned or imputed, is the Greek word logizomai. Logizomai, it's there in the green in your handout. Logizomai is to count or to number, to consider or suppose, to deem or judge 
as such. Logizomai. So here's what, here's what we're saying about it. Abraham believed God, and we're coming back to that in a minute. He believed God, and God, logizomai, he counted it as if it was righteousness. Belief is not the same thing as righteousness, is it? I just got done telling you that many of the ways in which I am short of the righteousness of God is because there are things that I, in my head or maybe even in my heart, I I have some level of belief about those things, but it's not actually coming out in my actual behaviors, right? In actual righteousness. It's not working itself out that way, which tells me there's some problem in my belief system. But I'll tell you, even the things I really do believe, I fail at. Sometimes... Sometimes they're not even all my fault. Sometimes, sometimes it's the rest of y'all sinners out here <laughs> that trip me up, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes I'm just tired. So counted here is a very, very important word because God's taking something that's not it and counting it as if it were it. He's taking the belief of Abraham and logizomaiing it, he's counting it, he's deeming it, he's judging it as if it were dikeastuna, as if it was righteousness. So, why would God do this? It's because of his grace. It's because of the wonderful, wonderful grace of Jesus. In verses 4 and 5, we find out that it is God's grace that is willing to count faith as if it was righteousness. Brother Shinsky at the men's breakfast yesterday, and what a great time we had at the, at the men's breakfast. Uh, thank you, Deacon Vince. Came up to me, and he's, he obviously knew what I was preaching on, and he said, you know, Romans 5 is the verse many years ago when the light switch finally came all the way on for me about the gospel and getting saved. It's one of the great, great verses in the Bible to help us understand what this is all about. Look at what it says, verses 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, you go to work all week, your boss pays you at the end of the week, that's not grace. Right? If he doesn't pay you, it's theft. You earned it. And so the Bible says, now if you work for a reward, then when you get the reward, that's not grace. They owe it to you. It's a debt. Okay. Verse 5, here it is. But to him that worketh not, that didn't do the work, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. Who is it that would be willing to justify the ungodly? That's Jesus Christ. If you believe on Christ, believe on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted, logizomai, for righteousness. A couple more definitions. What do we mean by grace? It's another word. I, listen, we throw it around a lot as Christians, and we're going to keep doing it. We're gonna, we'll sing amazing grace and wonderful grace of Jesus and talk about his grace, but let's just hit pause for a quick second, make sure we all know what we mean by that. What's grace? The Greek word here is charis, and it means goodwill. It's the goodwill of God. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. It's loving kindness. It's not just a sentiment. Grace is not just a sentimental love. It's not that when God thinks about us, he feels all warm and fuzzy. It's loving kindness. It's it's a love that then goes into action. It begins to go to work. It begins to sacrifice itself to spend and be spent. It's favor. It's a benefit. It's a tangible outpouring. But the other thing you need to know about Harris, about grace, is that it is based on the giver and not on the receiver. That's what the verse Bible is telling us here. The re- him that worketh, the reward is not grace. If you have earned it, that's not really grace. It's not the Christian grace. It's not the charis that we're talking about. Because this grace is based on the giver 
and the love that the giver has for the person loved. Not what's earned. And it's based here on, we've used this, this word has been used a lot already, and let's define it also, faith, because people misunderstand faith. Faith in the Greek, it's pistis, and it's a conviction of truth. This is one of my little pet peeves as a pastor. You've been here for a while. You, you've heard me shout and stomp up here about faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is not thinking happy thoughts. I, I get annoyed. I, I see, I mean, I love Hobby Lobby. I actually really do. Some people think uh, I'm just saying that so my wife will date me, but I, 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 I go into Hobby Lobby and I, I get excited. I love Hobby Lobby. So, don't, so don't, don't, don't misinterpret what I'm about to say. But some of the posters and things that they have in there, and I, I appreciate that they play Christian music and they got lots of nice Christian things around there. I, I pre- they're closed on Sundays. Like, I appreciate that. But some of the posters they have is like, you know, faith is like believing it'll happen or something like that. And I, and I just like, I don't want to go to jail, so I don't tear those signs down. But, but that's not what faith is. That's not what the Christian faith is. You have all the faith in the world that, that this lamp can save you. And you might believe that. You might have more faith in that lamp than I have in Jesus Christ. you just filled with faith, and it will do you no good. Somebody say amen. amen. You all know this lamp can't save you no matter how much you believe in it. Is it that's, what's it do? Nothing. Your, your, the, your faith is only as good as whatever you put your faith in. Okay. So you, I didn't get a big enough amen, so I got excited there for a second. Okay. But what is faith? Faith is a conviction of truth. When you are convicted, when you are persuaded, when you are like, no, this is what's true, that's faith. That's what it is. So you better be as sure as you can be that whatever you have faith in really is true. That's what it means to have faith. Okay, so or belief is a fine translation of that. It's conviction of truth. So let's look at verse 5 again with this understanding. To him that worketh not, but believeth. So believeth here, it's the pusteo, which is the state of one who has faith. To one who believeth, the pusteo, on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith, his conviction of truth, is counted for righteousness. I mean, what a wonderful thing. This is, this is mind-blowing, the way that God's grace works. Because we, as we've established, we are none of us as we ought to be. We are none of us righteous. And God said, unless you're way more righteous than these hyper-religious people, you will definitely not go to the kingdom of heaven. So we are not righteous, and Abraham is not righteous. And if we're not going to do better than Abraham or these scribes or Pharisees, how on earth are we going to get to heaven? How on earth can we possibly be righteous enough? Can we do some good deeds, maybe to cancel out our bad deeds? No, we cannot. That will certainly not work. So what, if God loves us, which he does, how is he going to help us? Well, good news, God is holy and righteous and fair and just, but he also is a God of grace. It's very good news. And his grace, his favor, his goodwill, that's, by the way, not based on you or how good you're doing. His goodwill is based on himself and his character and his nature. And because God is a loving and kind God, because God is that way, God has elected by his grace to take our faith our conviction of truth about him and counted logizomai as if it was righteousness. In the scales of God's justice, even though there's no way we can actually be righteous, he says, I'll take your conviction of truth, I'll take your pisteo, and I'll set it on this side of the scale and we'll count it as if it was righteousness. (laughs) This is money that my son owes me. This is the chart. This is the ledger of the debt. Uh, So Hugo, uh, so he's eight now, and he started this little, uh, he calls it egg dash, kind of like door dash, but it's egg dash. And so last summer he worked really hard to learn. So we live out in the country a little ways and we have a little used uh, golf cart. And and so he really wanted to learn to drive it. And so I spent last summer really practicing with him and he's like taking it super serious. I printed out and laminated a little 
golf cart driver's license for him. <laughs> so, he got, he, so he got his golf cart driver's license, uh, or learner's permit, I think it still says learner's permit. Anyway, and so, so we have some chickens, and my, my, my mom and my dad have some chickens, and so he started this business, this business where he will deliver eggs to the neighbors, and he charges them a dollar, and then they tip him a dollar. And so the Starbirds were his first customers, Deacon Paul and Jessica down here. They just lived down the dirt road from us. And so, so he got, man, he came home with that first dollar from the Starbirds and was hooked. I mean, a little capitalist born right there, just, <laughs> just like that. And, uh, and so, so now he's got some of the other neighbors that he's delivering eggs to. And he's, and he's like, Dad, we need to get some more chickens. And so we, so we, got, some, we got some more chicks. because he's, he's, he's taking this business to the moon. All right. So he wants to buy these nesting boxes for the new chickens to lay in. And, and he, he's picking out the nesting boxes. And they're like, buddy, we can do this way cheaper than this. But he finds the nesting boxes that he, that he wants. And they're these fancy ones, you know. And I was like, Phew. It's like, all right, buddy, but this is your business. If you want to do this, you're going to need, you know, it's 70 bucks for these. So don't judge me. That's his, it's his. Thing. So he's 70 bucks. So, so he's like, okay, I'm going to get it. And it's like, well, you don't have $70, but, but you can get a loan from the bank of dad. Some of you are judging me even harder now. <laughs> so his, his mom and dad loaned him the 70 bucks and we made him up a little ledger. And then as he, as he gets the money, then we're striking off the, the debts. So till he, pay, till he pays off his debt for his new nesting boxes. So, because you know, we got the nesting, we got the checks, so we need the nesting boxes. So that's how debt works. Amen? Okay. Not an economics lesson. I just... I'm, I'm really proud of him. All right. So he's, so he's already, so then he, he goes and he raids his cash. And he's like, he wants to get out of debt as quick as possible. Took a lesson from Gaffa. That's right. Pay that debt off as quick as he can. So he is, so he's always, so he's like, if I can get an extra dollar for this and can I get an extra dollar from that? And he's paying down his debt as fast as he can. And so I just love that. So last night he comes in, this is, this is 100% true story. It's so good. And I was like, this has got to go into the sermon. So he comes into my office last night and I was working on that slide. I was just showing you with the, with the scales, right? So he comes in my office and he's like, Ooh, what's that? And so I'm explaining to him the way that God's grace works and that God will count something that's not really it, but because he loves us, he'll count it as if it were something else. And I said to him, it'd be like if I said to you, if you give dad a kiss goodnight, I'll count it as if you paid me a dollar. <laughs> like you haven't actually paid me a dollar, but I'll count it that way because of my grace. What do you think of that? Big old smooch for dad. <laughs> And I got the marker out right in front of him and we shook, took a buck off what he owed me. Just like that. He's going to try that again tonight, I'll bet. Um, <laughs> it's probably going to work. <laughs> just for this analogy, worth, worth every nickel I paid. But I just, how wonderful is the grace of God that he'd be willing to take something simple, something that we can do, that we can, have, we can trust him. We can decide that we believe God, that we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that God would take that, just, just, just our faith, just our, our conviction that that's true. And he'd say, you know what? I'm going to count that as if you were righteous. How wonderful, how amazing is the grace of God. In verses 6 through 8, the Bible helps us to understand that this is not just in a new idea even. He, he reminds us about the great blessing of God's grace, the great blessing of it. See, this is not a new idea to the New Testament. Sometimes people get this idea that, well, God was very mean in the Old Testament, and that in the New Testament, God kind of had to change a heart and got a lot nicer. But, 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 but as we've already seen, the, the argument here for the Christian definition of salvation by faith, of righteousness by faith, does not start with Jesus Christ. It starts with Abraham. In fact, it doesn't start with Abraham. It starts in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. From the very beginning, God's grace to take faith and to uh, count it, to logizomai it as righteousness has always been God's way of dealing with broken people. And we see it very powerfully in Abraham, but we see it in the life of King David also, in the life of the psalmist. And, and the, the apostle here reminds us of that in verse 6. He says, even as David also, it's not just Abraham, look at David, he says. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth, counts it, even though it's not really that, 
he counts it righteousness without works. Right? Do you understand there's that, that, that's a nonsense statement if not for the grace of God? What do you mean righteousness without works? The righteousness is the works. But even David understood the real blessing, the great blessing, is to have God my to count you as righteous even though you haven't done the work. That's the blessing. That's the blessed state. Look at, he quotes the psalmist, verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Listen, it would be a blessing to not have any iniquities. It would be a blessing to not have any sins. But we've missed that blessing already. So, the blessing is the one whose sins have been forgiven and covered. Blessed, verse 8, he says, is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. But it's, that impute there, it's the same word, it's like my. Blessed is the man whom God will not count their sins. I mean, sometimes people struggle, sometimes I struggle to think, could God really just not count them? Maybe there's somebody here this morning and you think you have fallen too far. You have messed up too much that God could not possibly save you because of all that you've done wrong. You have the opposite problem of the person who thinks they've done nothing wrong. May I say to you this morning that the true blessed state is to have sins forgiven. Jesus said, the one that's been forgiven a little loves a little. But the one that's been forgiven much loves much. You are not too far down for the grace of God. And that is at least in part, as verses 9 to 15 tells us, that it's because grace is not based on merit. It's not based on merit. It's not based on how good you're doing. Some, some versions of human grace are based on merit. <laughs> I am just really proud of Hugo taking his, I mean, because he, he feeds those chickens and he waters those chickens and he checks their eggs and he drives very responsibly. I watch him, you know, he gets on the golf cart to go deliver the eggs and he gets down to the end of the driveway and he looks left and he looks right. <laughs> We live out in the, I mean, there's, there's no cars for miles. And then left again, and then right again, and then he goes around the corner. It just makes my heart just, I'm just so proud of him, right? And so it's easy to say, I'm going to give you a buck. We're going to knock a buck off the debt, right? Because he's doing good. If he were sassing me and lazing around on the couch, I might not be so inclined to do that, right? That's human kinds of grace. But God's grace especially the salvation grace. It's not based on how good we're doing. Look at this discussion here in verses 9 to 15. I'll have to move through it quickly. Verse 9. Cometh this blessedness, this grace, then upon the circumcision only. So circumcision here is the sign, the covenantal sign of the Jewish people with God, right? But it's a, it stands, it's, it means that, but it's also a metaphor for the law. And I'll remind you, the law, the Ten Commandments don't come till Moses centuries after Abraham. Okay. So he says, come as his blessedness, this merit upon the circumcision only, or on the uncircumcision also. For if we say that faith was reckoned, Lagizomai, to Abraham for righteousness, how was it reckoned? In other words, how did God calculate it up? Did he calculate it? Was it reckoned while he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? It's a, it's a history question. Genesis 15, when, it, when the Bible says that Abraham believed God and he counted it to him for righteousness, was he a circumcised man at that point or not? The answer is he was not. When Abraham got counted as righteous, he'd not, he, he didn't even have the sign of the covenant, let alone the covenants or the law. He had nothing except his belief in God. And if you don't believe me, it says it here at the end of verse 10, Abraham was not in circumcision, but he was in uncircumcision. And he received 
received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. In other words, it's not because Abraham did good, got circumcised, therefore he got counted as righteous. He got counted as righteous and therefore he got the sign of circumcision. That came afterwards. In other words, his recognition of righteousness was not dependent on him doing well first. God counted him as righteous, and then Abraham started to do better. You don't do better so that God will count you as righteous. God counts you as righteous, and then out of just overflowing appreciation for God, we say, I ought to do better. You see the difference? He received the sign of circumcision as the seal of the righteousness of faith, the pistis, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. Even though we're not doing it all right, even though we're not part of the right family or running with the right crowd, Abraham is not the father of those that are circumcised. He's the father of those that believe. though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness, the diaskone, might be imputed, lagazomai, unto them also. And the father of circumcision to those who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. In other words, so it's not that it's like it doesn't matter what we do. Somebody say amen. It matters what we do. The point here is not that it doesn't matter, that you shouldn't try to do what's right. Abraham did try to do what's right. The point is, it wasn't his efforts to do what was right that made him righteous. His faith made him righteous, and then he began to try to diligently do what was right. Not perfectly, up and down, go read it. But that's what he's saying. For the promise, verse 13, that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, hadn't even come yet. The promise Abraham received was through the righteousness of faith. Not the righteousness of his works, not the righteousness of his efforts, not the righteousness of his trying real super hard. The righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. The promise is made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. If there's no laws, you can't break them right? So what's the law do? <laughs> it makes us lawbreakers. Unless you can keep it perfectly, which you can't. The law just exposes how far short of right we are, as if we need it. Your conscience and mine tells us already how far short we are. Romans 3.20 makes it very clear, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law was never there so that we could keep it and therefore be righteous. The law is there to help us be really super clear on how not righteous we are. And then again, sums it up for us in case we've missed it in verse 16. The righteousness is of faith by grace. Do not take for granted that God is somehow obligated to take our faith and count it as righteousness. It's a crazy thought. Every religion in the world except for Christianity rejects this idea. They all reject it. There is no other religion that teaches this idea. That the faith will count as if it were righteousness. That's why we give out the done books. Every Sunday, we give out done books. Some of you will take them and give them to your friends, and I, I love that. If you, if you got a, somebody you're witnessing to and you want an extra done book, let us know. We'd love to give you one. Done. Why is it called done? It's because every other religion in the world says, do these things and don't do those things. And if you do these things and don't do those things, you can be righteous. But the message of the Bible is done. Done by Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. That's the love that Jesus Christ has for you. That he's willing to offer you righteousness based on your faith rather than on your actual righteousness. 
Look at verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. It is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only that which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith by Abraham, who is the father of us all. Romans 5, 12 is there in your outline, 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith into what? Into God's grace. So it's by faith we enter into his grace. And what is that grace? That grace says, I'm going to take that faith and count it as righteousness. That's the grace. And we enter into it by faith. Summarizing here, then closing, wrapping this up, and we'll make some application. Romans 4, 17, then the apostle spells out for us the grace that was given to Abraham. Let's read it quickly. Verse 17. As is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is what God said to Abraham while he was childless. He's old. His wife is old. They're both past childbearing years. Or I mean, Sarah is especially. Abraham's quite old. And God says, I'll make you a father of many nations to a guy who has no kids. Before whom he believed. He believed in Abraham. So God says this impossible thing to Abraham. And Abraham believes him. Believes God. Even God who quickeneth or makes alive the dead and calleth those things that are not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. God takes Abraham out and says, look at the night sky. You can't count those stars. You won't be able to count your descendants either. And Abraham, childless, believes it. Believes God. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So in other words, Abraham, he wasn't bothered by the fact that he's a hundred and can't have kids anymore. He's not bothered by the fact that Sarah is barren and can't have children and has been her whole life and is now too old. She was barren when she was in childbearing years and now those years are long gone and God says to him, hey, I'm gonna give you descendants like the stars of the heavens and, and Abraham says, I'm not worried that I'm dead and I'm not worried that she's dead. God raises the dead. And so he said, I believe you then. It's bananas. Verse 20, says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, convicted of the truth. And what was the truth that Abraham believed that he was convicted of? Here it is. That what he had promised, he was able to perform. He so said, if God said it, I believe he can do it. End of story. All the other impossibilities fall away. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. You see that? It's not the good or the bad that Abraham did. When God made Abraham a promise, Abraham believed it, even though it seemed impossible. Life from the dead. He says, I believe it. So God took that faith and he counted it as if Abraham was righteous, imputed it, logizomide it unto him which is the same way God treats you and me today. That there's grace for Abraham, but I want you to know this morning, there's grace for you. There's grace for you. Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed. God didn't repeat this in, in Genesis accounts and throughout the Bible that it was imputed to him just so that we could know how God handled Abraham. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, verse 24, but also for us, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe, and what are we asked to believe? That we're going to have descendants like the stars? No. What's the thing, Christian, that we've been asked to believe? Look at what it says in verse 24. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. That's a hard thing to believe too, isn't it? We hit that real hard last Sunday. If you missed it, I invite you to go back and get that sermon from last Sunday. It's a hard thing that Christians, we've been asked to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. An impossible thing. But for those like Abraham who are not staggered at the promises of God, 
but say, God said it and I believe it. God looks at that faith and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He looks at that faith, that belief, and says, I'll count it as if it was righteousness. How good is God? How good is God? That he would say, if you'll just believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll count it. I'll count it as righteousness. Our faith results in imputed righteousness. All right. So let's make our application here. We, we spent a lot of time digging through that. These next parts will go a little bit quicker as we make the application. Here's the core Bible truth. And I've hit it a whole lot now. I don't feel I need to hit it super hard now again. But we are saved. Christians, the Bible message is this. We are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by our righteous works, by our good efforts, our good deeds, our good intentions. We are not saved by trying super hard, by telling fewer lies than the politicians. That's not how you're going to get to heaven. We're saved by the grace of God. And how do we enter into that grace of God? Through faith. When we hear this impossible thing that God has said, and we believe it, we, we have reckoned up ourselves that it's true. We are convicted of the truth about Jesus Christ. And if you're convinced about the truth of Christ, the Bible says God will count that as if it was righteousness. Ephesians 2 is there in your outline. Ephesians 2 and 4 says like, like this. But God, who is rich in mercy, for the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he's quickened, he's made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And he hath raised us up together, and he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You didn't earn God's grace. God wasn't so impressed by our good works that he said, I'm going to use your faith to fill in the gap right? It's not like we are saving money for a car and, you know, at the end of the summer, we didn't quite save up enough money for the car. And so God says, you know what? You did pretty good. I'll give you the rest of the money so you can get the car. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not Pastor Josh and poor indebted Hugo where I'm giving him little bits of grace to help him out in paying off his debt. It's not what we're talking about. What's it say? It says, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But because of God's grace and his kindness towards us, that God has decided not based on our merit, but because of his love for you, because of his kindness towards you, that he's willing to accept your faith as if it was righteousness. Galatians 2, same thing. The Bible says this over and over. These are just two of my favorites. Galatians 2, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we which have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified you're not going to be righteous enough to go to heaven. That's why we need God's grace. And God says, you can have, here's the grace. The grace is, I'll count your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I'll count it. We'll log eeds it as if it was actually righteousness. Now, the devil hates this, and there are many, many attacks on the truth. I want to talk about the two big ones here before we're done today. The first big one is this, and I've taken a hatchet to it already, but let's do one more. 
The devil, the enemy would like you to think you can earn your own salvation. It, it can be humbling to go, I'm not righteous. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. And I, there's nothing I can do to make it up. People want to pay their own debts. I mean, good people broadly do. Right? We don't want to just stick somebody else with the bill. And so that, that, that attitude can be and is praiseworthy in many contexts. And so I get it. A lot of times when I meet people that like don't want to get saved, they don't want to become Christians, and, and they, 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 it kind of comes sometimes from a place of, of self-reliance, of I don't need Jesus to save me. I, I got this. I, if you need that crutch... If you, if, you, if, you, if you can't handle it on your own, you need somebody to help you, okay, but I don't need a crutch. I, I'll take care of it. I'll stand on my own two feet in front of God. I don't know what they're saying. They will stand in front of God. The Bible tells us about a man that did. They call him the rich young ruler. Don't know his name. But he was, he had his life together and he stood on his own two feet in front of God in his own righteousness. You can read about it. It's in Matthew chapter 19. It's there in your outline. Behold, one came unto him and he said, good master. It's not a great start. Talking to Jesus. Good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He said, Jesus, what do I need to do? How do I, I want to earn eternal life. What do I need to do to get it? Jesus, right out of the box, Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. <laughs> this guy doesn't believe that Jesus is God. He says, hey, teacher, you're a pretty good teacher. Tell me, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? What do I need to do? Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good person, that's God. Now, Jesus is God, but this guy doesn't believe that. So Jesus already we're off to a bad start, right? Okay. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. But he says, but, but I'll tell you the answer anyway. Here it is. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Just, okay. Just obey the law. <laughs> and what is the very next question if you tell somebody that? still true today. It was true back in Jesus' day. It's true today. You tell somebody, oh, just keep the law. The very next question is this. Which? <laughs> which ones? It's a good question. So Jesus said, well, try not to kill anybody. Right? Well, look at it. Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And uh, while you're at it, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Which, by the way, the Jews and Christ all identified as the second greatest commandment. He's already failed the first one. Which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So Jesus says, well, let's try the second. Love your neighbor as yourself. The young man saith unto him, brace yourselves. The young man said unto him, all these things I have kept from my youth up. He says, I've done that. Check and done. <laughs> now, what this tells me about this person is that this guy was a trier. His parents were triers. He was born into a religious home. This guy probably has, probably has the Old Testament memorized. Knows the laws. And has tried to keep them. He's been after it. This guy is a guy for sure who's tithing on the salt he puts on his food. Jesus, so he says, well, I've done that. And then he has a very interesting question again. What do I still lack? Something in his heart is telling him that he's not he's not, he's not as, as he ought to be. He's nervous. So he says, what am I still missing? I've done all that. Which he obviously has not, which Jesus is going to help him see. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus said, okay, if you want to be perfect, which is what we're after, if that will be perfect, go and sell what thou hast and give it to the poor 
and then thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Oh, you love your neighbor as yourself? I see you got a lot of money. Jesus said, you have neighbors that you say you love as yourself? They're going to go to bed hungry tonight. There are kids in this town. Jesus knows their name. Jesus knows how many hairs are on their head. And they're not going to get dinner. He said, but you got a pile of money back home. Give it away. You want to be perfect? You love your neighbor like yourself? You got the stuff. There are people out here that are hurting. You could help them. You want to be perfect? Get started. Come follow me. But the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Do not, please, do not believe the lie that you can earn perfection. You cannot earn your way to heaven. We need to take seriously what Jesus said about what it would actually cost to do it. And if you're not willing to pay it, that's your choice because you could do this. The second lie, the second attack on the truth is that God's grace will just save everybody whether they want it or not. Now, God's grace is available to save everybody. Someone say amen. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. Does that mean God's going to save people that don't want to be saved? Some days I wish it was true. I got people on my list. So do you. I, I, and I want God to just save them even though they're just telling them no. Did you know that heaven's not a prison? A place that you must go, that you cannot leave, is a prison. It's a nice one. Comfortable. But prison. God is not going to save people who reject him. It's a terrifying thing that God would honor that kind of a choice that we would make. It's based on faith. It's based on the pistule. The conviction of truth about Jesus Christ. And if we don't believe that's true, if we reject Christ, God honors that choice. In fact, <laughs> It's not like God, sometimes people get the idea that God's just like dealing out judgment on people that won't believe in Christ. That's, that's 100% the wrong way to look at it. We're already under the judgment. <laughs> You're already unrighteous. Remember? We're already in a pickle. And God says, here, by my grace, here's a way out. Say, I don't want that way out. Well, then you have picked your path. I'll be righteous enough on my own. Have at it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Whoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. There's not like, there's this extra condemnation. We're already not as we ought to be. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The truth is we are saved by grace through faith. You cannot earn it, but you must trust God. You must accept his offer to take your faith in the only begotten Son of God 
and to count it as if it were righteousness. It's the only way to get actual righteousness. This is what Christians have always stood for. This is the core Christian stand for truth from our earliest creeds, from the Bible itself, of course, and then through the earliest Christian statements like the Nicene Creed, puts it like this. We believe in one God. Sometimes I think we can gloss over that when we look at the Nicene Creed. That it doesn't say we follow the one God or we serve the one God or we're trying our best to do the things that God told us. No, we believe in him. What is our hope? What are we counting on? How are we going to get to heaven? How are we going to be righteous people? We believe. That's it. We believe in him. We believe in one God and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and he was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and by the Virgin Mary and he was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and he suffered and he was buried in the third day. Up from the grave he... Oh, that's it. All right. So what's it do for us? What's it mean today? And then VBS and lunch. Here it is. God's grace has made righteousness possible through faith. It just wasn't possible before. We just... If you're honest even a tiny bit, you'll just have to admit that being actually righteous was just not ever possible. Not for me. I've heard stories about when I was two. Natural for me to not do what's right. But the real problem is when I got older and I understood the difference between right and wrong and I knew something was right and I chose not to do it. And I knew something was wrong. I knew it old enough to get the concept, knew it was wrong, decided to do it anyway, picked myself. And from then on, it's a downward spiral of selfishness. It was never going to be possible for Josh Tucker to be righteous. But God, in his grace, has made righteousness an available option for Josh Tucker. Not by Josh's works, but by my faith in Christ. And I will never, ever, ever get over that God gave me that option. Knowing all about me and all the ways I would continue to fail him and continue to disappoint, continue to be selfish, knowing all that about Jesus, knowing all, Jesus knowing all that about me, still said, I'll count your faith as if you were actually doing what was right. Thank you, Jesus. Titus 3 puts it like this. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that, despite all of that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards men appeared. Not by the works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heaven, because of the grace of God. How does it change us? The change in our daily lives, I want to suggest three things to you as we close. Number one, as Christians, we respond in faith to God's offer of salvation. The Bible is as clear as it can be that if you want to escape the treadmill of trying to be good enough, the way out by his grace, God has said, I'll accept your faith as if it was righteousness. So my question to you this morning is, have you judged that to be true? Do you believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Do you believe that he died on an old rugged cross for you and in your place? Do you believe that three days later he left an empty tomb behind him? If you believe that, I have really, really good news for you. 
God will count that as if you were righteous. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The real righteousness doesn't come from the behaviors. It comes from the heart that actually believes in Christ. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You should tell somebody about that. Don't keep that bottled up. As Christians, not only do we respond in faith, we go and we send to share the good news. Not everybody knows this. They're still trying to earn it. They need to know about the escape hatch. They need to know about the grace of God. We need to go and tell them. We need to send others to tell them. And as Christians and here at Spokane Baptist, we do that. Romans 10 continues on. This great statement of salvation, the righteousness that comes by faith, continues on in the next verses. To say, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how will they call on him in whom they've not believed? Like, why would someone ask Jesus to save them if they don't believe in Jesus? Right? I mean, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to ask him to save you. That makes sense. And then he says another question. How will they believe in him on whom they've not even heard? Some of them have never heard this good news. They might have heard maybe the name of Jesus. They know something about Christianity or the cross or as Easter and maybe there's bunnies involved. They're not real sure. No one's told them that they can be saved. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We gotta go. Your feet gotta go. Some fish jump in the boat, praise God. I love it when fish jump in the boat. Every so often, some lost person will just flop into church and go, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> and we're just like, well, that was a freebie. <laughs> praise God. You know, here's water, hold on. Right? Now, I mean, every so often, that happens, and praise the Lord. But mostly, lost people don't go to church. You know why? Because sleeping in is awesome. They don't know. They're lost. Somebody's got to go. Somebody that knows has got to go. And we rejoice in God's amazing grace. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. Sister, if you're able to come and play, I invite you here as the piano plays. I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm long. I, I know it's a simple message. That you get saved by grace through faith. That's it. I said it at the start. I said it a hundred times in this message. Before we go, while the piano plays, would you take a moment If you're here today and God's calling you to respond in faith to his provision of grace, listen, I, I'm not against altar calls, but, but I, don't, I don't generally do them. And I'll tell you why. Because the faith that God honors is not an emotional response. It's a conviction of truth. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if, God, if you're here this morning and God's dealing with your heart about a conviction about the truth of these things, would you stay and talk to somebody about it? Stay for lunch. You can suffer through the VBS meeting. One of us pastors, Brother David, Brother Scott, somebody will sit with you after church is over. walk through these verses, answer any questions you might have right from the Bible. Make sure that you understood this, that there's a conviction about the truth of Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you'll do that, you're saved. God is willing to count that faith as righteousness. Your faith in Christ 
as righteousness. If you're not sure we're about where you stand with God, if you're not 100% sure that you've been forgiven, that heaven's your home, stay for lunch. If you can't do that, get on our schedule for a cup of coffee. We'd love to help you know for sure. Maybe there's something you just need to talk to Jesus about today. Maybe there's something God's asking you to do today. There's a going or ascending or God's burned your heart with somebody you need to talk to. Maybe it's been a while since you just poured your heart out in praise and thanksgiving to God for his amazing grace. Whatever it is you need to do, you take a moment of quietness with you and the Lord.